بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيد الأولين والآخرين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد As you all know the terrorist incident that took place barely happened two days ago and so it is still fresh in our minds and there are certain things that I believe need to be said so I'd like to take this opportunity to say them first and foremost we are an ummah known as ummatul jasad al wahid as a larger Muslim community and we're talking about the international the global Muslim community we are like one body we are as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said like one body if one of its limbs aches if one of its limbs uh, feel some pain then the rest of the body reacts and the rest of the body is 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 you know kept sleepless and it is overcome with fever as the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam put it and we are as allah jalla wa ala told us innama al mu'minuna ikhwa we the believers are brothers and sisters one to another that is the nature of this ummah so obviously if something happens to Muslims anywhere in the world, the rest of us are going to feel it and we have a right to feel it. As a matter of fact, it's our duty and it's our obligation to feel the pain of our fellow Muslims wherever they may be. And these terrorist attacks that took place in New Zealand, it so happens that the victims were our Muslim brothers and sisters. Children were killed. Men and women were killed. So it is a big deal. And it's important for us, as I said, to react. But the issue is, how are we to react? And what's important for us also to understand is, as Muslims, everything in our lives is regulated. There are guidelines for everything, even how we mourn. This we find in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, in his time, of course, many calamities took place. Many tragedies took place. Uh, besides the fact that he had personal losses, where he lost his own grandson, for example. All right, they were his companions also. Among them, the Qurra, the reciters of the Quran at the time, those who were sent to educate others. All sorts of tragic events took place. But you know, as I said, even the way that we react is regulated by our religion. Our religion, see, we don't have a narrow view of what religion is. It's not just a set of do's and don'ts and a set of, you know, beliefs and, and, and that's it and it remains within the mosque and it's something just very personal. No. Our religion covers every single aspect of our lives, private as well as public. How we relieve ourselves and how we cleanse ourselves after we relieve ourselves is also mentioned in our religion. In other words, we have guidance for it in our religion. So yes, when this happens, the heart is grieved. When something like this happens, we feel it in our hearts. We have heavy hearts. Tears come to our eyes. We are extremely saddened by what our fellow Muslims had to go through. But at the end, we still only say that which pleases our Creator subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as I said yesterday in the khutbah, we also only do that which pleases our Creator 
Allahu Jalla wa Ala. And so we are taught in the Quran what to say when calamity strikes. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Because it's a reminder. Indeed, we belong to Allah. He is our Lord. He is our Master. We literally belong to Him. We are His slaves. We are His creation. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun. And the reality is that we will return unto Him, Subhanahu wa Taala. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. And after that. We also remind ourselves, Inna lillahi ma akhath, walahu ma a'ta, wa kullu shay'in indahu bi ajalin musamma, fal nasbir wal nahtasib. This also is training us how to react in the face of calamity. When tragedy strikes, we remind ourselves, to Allah belongs whatever He takes. Inna lillahi ma akhath, wa lahu ma a'ta. And to him belongs whatever he gives. And everything with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a set term. Wa kullu shay'in indahu bi ajalin musamma. So when something happens, fal nasbir. Then we need to practice self-restraint. Then we need to observe patience. Wal nahtasib. And we anticipate reward from Allah. You know, the, the fact that we control ourselves, the fact that we are patient, and we don't object to what Allah has written for us. It's very important for us to, to, to realize all of these things. We don't say, oh, why did Allah do this to us? We didn't deserve this. Why did that three-year-old child die? He wasn't meant to die, as they would say. It was too soon for him. He had a whole life ahead of him. No, he did not. It was his time. Allah had already determined that this would be his time and this is how he will go. <laughs> so when these things happen, we practice self-restraint in every way. We watch our tongues. We don't say except that which pleases Allah Jalla wa ala. We don't object to what Allah has decreed for us. We don't cross any of those limits. We don't wail. Uh, are we allowed to cry? That's a natural reaction. But you know that wailing and that tearing of clothes and doing all sorts of things? No. Even in the time of the Prophet وسلم, when a woman had lost a child, she was standing near his grave and she was wailing and she was weeping and the Prophet وسلم, told her to be patient and he says, ah, she said to him, I mean, she didn't know who he was passing by at the time. And what did she say? The one who is afflicted knows better. And then when she realized, she went to the Prophet وسلم, and basically apologized for what she had said. She didn't realize it was him. And what was his teaching for all of us is that true patience is at the start of the calamity. In the sadmatil ula. So we need to be, uh, or, or, or our, um, our reaction needs to be measured. All right? We don't object. It happened. This was the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah knows best why it happened. And we, and we anticipate reward from Allah for our patience and also for our calamity. Now these Muslim men and women and even children who were killed and injured, even they anticipate the reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not to make light of what happened. What happened is a tragedy. What happened was horrific but at the same time we don't forget the realities of things first and foremost it was the will of Allah Jalla wa ala. next those victims our brothers and sisters our children those victims do you know where they were they were in one of the houses of Allah Jalla wa ala. the best places on the face of this earth are the masajid 
The masajid are the best of places. And they happen to be in the best of places on the best of days. Yawmul Jumu'ah. And they were there on the best of days, in the best of places, to carry out perhaps the best act of ibadah, the best act of worship, as salah. Are we getting it now? So they were there on the right day, in the right place, and for the right reason. And therefore, the fact that those who were killed on that day, as horrific as it is, and so on and so forth, except that for them, for them, insha'Allah ta'ala, there is al-Jannah. For them is paradise. Insha'Allah, all of their sins would have immediately been forgiven. Because they are in the hukum or the ruling of a shaheed, a martyr. And we beg of Allah Jalla wa'ala to accept them as martyrs. So, I mean, it's doom and gloom? No, not, not all the way. There is, there is something for them in it. And that is that they will attain paradise, insha'Allah ta'ala, because we have a firm belief that there is something called paradise and there is something called hell. And we believe that insha'Allah, insha'Allah, their place is paradise. May they be granted the highest levels of paradise. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala console their families and grant them the most beautiful, the most beautiful of patience. Tayyip. Now that we have gotten that out of the way, and we realize that, you know, it's not all doom and gloom there. And we also, once again, remind ourselves that yes, فَالنَّصْبِرْ وَالنَّحْتَسِبْ We have to be patient and anticipate reward from Allah. But let's not also have the wrong interpretation of that. By a wrong interpretation, I mean what some people are doing now. And they're saying, you know, we have to have sabr, we have to have ihtisab, uh, you know, be patient, anticipate reward from Allah, and let it slide. And let it slide. In other words, let's just, just roll over and play dead. Let's forgive everybody. Let's kiss and make up. No, 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 no. That is not the reaction that we're supposed to have. Just forget about it, let bygones be bygones? No, not at all. That is not going to happen. Because this was not an isolated incident. And it was not a spur of the moment thing. What happened was planned. And the proof of that is clear. I mean, the guy has a manifesto that he put up online. He actually went in guns a-blazing and he, he was airing it live. I mean, this is not something that just happened on the spur of the moment. And I'm saying again, it was not an isolated incident. If anybody knows, we know. Quebec City, have we forgotten? What was it, about two years ago? So it's not an isolated incident. Quebec City and uh, New Zealand are not the only two cases. We know what happened in the UK, we know what happened in France, we know what happened in, in the United States. There are lots of cases like this. So no, we do not let it slide. Yes, we will be patient and we will be uh, anticipating reward with Allah, but we're not going to forgive. And we're not going to forget. Something needs to be done. And what needs to be done and how it needs to be done, these are some things that I hope to speak about in just a little while. But I also want to shed light on something else. Again, we have to live with reality. You know, for us to just speak and, and try, to, uh, try to make everything better by, by, by our words, it's not going to work. We have to call a spade a spade. You know, at the beginning, when we first heard about these uh, shootings, when this terrorist attacks uh, be began, notice that the word terrorist was not used, nor was the uh, phrase um, hate-motivated crime used, no nothing of that nature. A shooter and so on and so forth. Later on, of course, they declared it to be a terrorist attack. I mean, how could you not? It was textbook. And up to now, to the best of my knowledge, and I've been checking, up to now, the religion of that individual was not mentioned. But if it was a person of color, Allah forbid, 
And by the way, just as an aside, we are not denying that people who identify as Muslims do such things. We're not denying that. We know that there are some who identify as Muslims who may do crazy things like that. Let's not fool ourselves. We have to be honest. We tell the truth even if it's against ourselves. And even if it's about the closest of people to us. We tell it like it is. In any event, if it were to be somebody with, you know, who looked Middle Eastern, and we've seen that before, if it's somebody who had a name that was you know, Muslim sounding, if the person was a person of color, and you know, we know what's going to happen. Immediately, not only would they use the word terrorist, but they would call it Islamic terrorism. They would say that he's jihadi, but the word Islam or Muslim and terrorism would be hand in hand. It took a while, but eventually they declared it to be terrorism. But where's, where's the religion? Why is that not mentioned? The reality is he's a Christian. So the one who carried out these terrorist attacks was a Christian extremist. A Christian extremist. And he happens also to be a white supremacist. That's what he is. Why not mention it? Having said all of that, if you recall way back when, I think it was in 2017 when those horrific attacks took place or that horrific attack took place in the masjid, in the mosque in Quebec City. I said at that time, we have to be just and we have to be fair. Just because when a Muslim does something like this, they blame Islam and they blame all the Muslims we will not do the same. Because this is not what our religion teaches us. Our Islam teaches us to be just. Even if there is conflict between us, justice is required. Irrespective of what is between you and, and another group of people, be just. Don't allow um, you know, bad feelings or enmity or whatever to get in the way of being just. Be just, that is closer to piety. That is closest to righteousness. And so, yes, he was a Christian extremist and a white supremacist, but we are not going to pin what he did on all Christians nor are we going to pin what he did on all white people because that would not be fair and we're very open about it however just look look back at previous articles of when things happened with muslims the whole muslim nation is is blamed and we are paying the price of it up until today if you read articles on and, and statistics on how many attacks take place in America, for example. Guess what? The vast majority are not carried out by people of color or by, or by Muslims. That's a fact. That's a reality. But what happens afterwards? We're still, we're still the bad guys. We are always made to look evil. All right, so um, I just wanted to get some of these things out of the way, out of the way as well. طيب. There's so many things to be said, so I've made notes and, and I'll try to stick to my notes as much, as much as I can. So we said we have to react and we have to do something about what took place. And I kept hearing this yesterday, everywhere you, you, you turn, you hear people talking about this was horrible. This type of thing should not happen. And we have to do something about it. You know what? Us saying those words is not going to make it happen. Us saying those words is not going to change anything. Us lighting candles is not going to change anything. Just one more quick thing. We said that because a Christian did it, 
and a white person did it. We don't blame all Christians, nor do we blame all white people. As a matter of fact, from the reactions that we saw from many, many a people, we know and we realize that there are decent people out there, even though they may not be Muslims. Yes. And, you know, the, um, the, the warm and sincere condolences from so many of them. And, you know, everybody does things in a different way. So there are those who came and gave flowers to mosques. My neighbor today came and gave me, you know, a whole uh, uh, plant. I mean, yes, we, we understand that not, not everybody is, is evil. And there are many good people out there. So this also I want to make clear because then we don't want people to misconstrue what we are saying. Okay? So we realize that there are decent people out there, but still we have to look at reasons why this may have happened. What are the real causes? So I, what I was saying is that those fluffy words, those you know, warm and fuzzy words, they are not going to change anything. And just throwing out the words, we need solidarity, we need unity, meaningless. I'm sorry to say, but people have been saying that forever, but nothing happens because that is not the problem. And before we start talking about what the real problem is, I want to shed light on another reality. The reality that you and I are living. Okay? And once again, we tell the truth no matter what. Whether it be in New Zealand, and this is what we hear from our brothers and sisters there, or Australia, or the UK, or here in Canada, even the United States, and I've been there many times, the average person on the streets, I'm talking about the, 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 the ordinary Joe out there, okay? The John Doe and the Jane Doe out there. The people that you and I live next door to. The people that you and I shop with. The people that you and I study with. The people that you and I work with. For the most part, are these evil people? Do they show hostility and enmity towards us? I'm being very frank. They don't. And you know what? Leave religion aside. All of us share so many common concerns, such as we got to work. We, we need to find work so we can afford rent, so we can afford to put food on our tables, so we can afford to educate our children. These are common concerns that we all have. All of us are busy in life. We all have things to accomplish. I'm saying religion aside, we have all of these things in common. And so when you go to the supermarket, when you go to the drugstore, wherever you go and you shop, people smile at you, you smile back at them, we speak to one another in, in, a, in a very uh, decent manner. Nobody looks at the other, you know, and says, oh, you know, the, the, I hate this person because they belong to, or they, 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 they're not part of my religion. They don't follow the same. We don't do that on an everyday basis. Let's be honest. Is this how we live? No. We live in harmony with people around us. We are harmless, just like our neighbors are harmless. Alhamdulillah, we have to, we have to admit to all of these things. And you know, I'm mentioning this because it should get us to think. Then why do we have these problems? The masses are good. I mean, of course, the masses are good, but you still have crimes. Okay, so people steal. And, I mean, this, is, this happens in any society. But we're talking about something big. We're talking about now uh, targeting people for you know, political gain, targeting them because they are following another religion and all sorts of things like that. Like, what are... Uh, some of the main reasons behind that. From my read of things, we have heard this new term being used, Islamophobia. What is Islamophobia? Okay, uh, I mean, of course, people are going to give all sorts of definitions and so on. I found one that I, I'd like to just read it to you as it came. It's an exaggerated, uh, according to this definition, it's an exaggerated fear 
hatred and hostility toward Islam and Muslims that is perpetuated by negative stereotypes resulting in bias, discrimination, and the marginalization and exclusion of Muslims from social, political, and civic life. That seems quite comprehensive. Basically, Islamophobia is instilling fear in people's hearts and causing them to hate Islam and Muslims, making them targets. To summarize, and it is well and alive today. Okay? But still, we have to question. Where is that coming from? Because you know what? Band-Aid solutions are not going to do it for us. Having more cameras and more security, uh, am I saying not to do those things? Relax. Quite to the contrary. We have something in, in Islam that we call Al-Akhdu Bil-Asbab. And you know the, the, the common um, expression that is used, right? You have to rely upon Allah, but what is it you have to do before that? You tie your camel, right? I mean, you have to make use of all the means available to you. You have to be proactive. So yes, we take precautions. We have to do that. If need be, we step up security. Sure, I mean, these things are natural. A bank gets robbed, guess what? They step up security. Things, things happen and you have to react in the right way. So I understand that many Muslims are speaking now of stepping up security uh, or security measures in their, in their centers and the masajid. So maybe some really don't have many cameras or they, they don't have any cameras or they have cameras but they're not placed in the right, you know, in, in the right uh, positions or places. So yes, they want to go through all of that, wonderful. I don't have any problem with that. Some, again, it differs from area to area. I mean, you and I, many of us may or may not realize living in this city of Victoria, we are quite blessed. I mean, we hear about what happens in some other cities, even just across the pond in, in Vancouver. We don't get half of that here. So we're in pretty good shape when it comes to that. It doesn't mean that we're immune. It doesn't mean that nothing will ever happen. So, but everywhere, they have their own circumstances and they'll decide whether they need to put a guard at the door. And in some places, guess what? That is probably a very wise thing to do because they live in a certain city or they live in an area where, unfortunately, um, they really need to be uh, very cautious of what's going to happen. Taib. But that's not a, that's not a long-term solution. That is not going to lead to, 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 to a permanent solution or it's not going to make a huge change because you know that even where there may be security and so on people, people still do crazy things so it's, it's something beyond just security measures this Islamophobia is caused and it is intentionally caused and I'm not going to hold any punches I'm going to tell it exactly as I see it. And I'm not saying it as a reaction. As a matter of fact, even those about whom I am speaking, I have told them directly to their faces, literally to their faces, on more than one occasion. And I have written about it, and I have spoken about it before as well. The very people who are now saying that they support us, the very people who are supposed to be protecting us are the ones who started this whole mess to begin with. And that's why I always say the government and law enforcement, and of course they're more or less one and the same. Law enforcement works under the government. The government, law enforcement, and media. They are the main culprits. They spread Islamophobia. They fuel the fires of Islamophobia. I say that not as an assumption, not as, you know, I believe that that's probably, no, I say it with certainty. I say that they are to blame. No doubt whatsoever. 
the governments, they have all sorts of agendas. Oil, I mean, I don't have to get into that. Everybody knows foreign policies, what they do, the, the, the amount of bloodshed that they cause overseas. And then they expect that not to come back on them. Well, we're not justifying terrorism in any way, shape or form. There's a difference between justifying and finding reasons behind. There's a difference between the two. But the government is definitely responsible. Law enforcement, I've told them directly, you are to blame. Inset, CSIS, you are to blame. Because of the nonsense that you carry out. You know, the, the inflammatory language they use, and the media, of course. The media plays that game as well. I remember, I mean, before any of this happened, I was so very young then. I'm talking about, you know, more than 20 years ago. Remember, they, they used to have these articles and they used to, uh, when something happened, even if it was in Iran or wherever it was, and the news would come out and holy war. Holy war, holy war. So everything for, but there's no al-harb al-muqaddasa. We don't have that terminology in Islam. And, but then what they did is they started slowly along with that to put the word jihad in and they would make it a synonym of holy war. And yes, Muslims over and over said, no, they are not synonymous. And yet they couldn't care less. Maybe they dropped the words holy war now, but because it's already ingrained in the people's minds. Jihad means holy war. Not only holy war, Islamic holy war. It is, in, it is embedded in the people's minds. So that's part of making people fear. The media, whether it be Hollywood or the news, they've been doing this all along. And look at, Muslims are always looked at as savages. Muslims, you know, are, are uh, bloodthirsty. They love war. They love to fight. They beat their women. They, come on. This is what is being put out there. And this, they really made sure that, 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 that these types of ideas are well ingrained in the people's minds. So the government is responsible, along with law enforcement. Yes, I don't trust law enforcement. I'm not talking about the traffic cop. I'm not talking about the transit police. I'm not talking about the poor guy who's, you know, walking the beat. I'm talking about the higher ups. There's a hierarchy. Up top, they have an agenda. Their, you know, their, their, their active involvement in entrapping people, Muslims, to carry out, I'm not saying that all those, uh, you know, crazy things that were done were entrapment. I'm not saying all of them were, but we certainly know of some that were. I mean, some of the truth always comes out. The fact that they spy on us, I'll, I'll be honest with you, people... People used to tell me always, oh, you got to be careful there. You know, they have ears. I said, so what? What am I doing wrong? What am I saying wrong? I couldn't care less. But that's not what it is. I couldn't care less because they couldn't find anything on me. I haven't done anything wrong. We as a community don't do anything wrong. But it's a matter of principle. Where are our rights? Where are my civic rights? Where's my right to privacy? Where is my right to be innocent until proven guilty? I said, you know, when the Toronto 17 incident happened, I was in that meeting that they called at one of the RCMP uh, quarters, maybe the headquarters out on, on Camby, I think, in, in, in Vancouver. And there's a woman there representing CSIS. And I said it to her directly. I said, yes, the problem with you is you have a theory and you're hell bent on proving that theory. You have no facts, there's no reality to it. You've created a boogeyman and the theory you have is Muslims must be guilty. And now you're hell bent on proving it. And guess what? That's exactly what they continue to do. Spying on us, trying to recruit people from our mosques. You think we're stupid? Do you think we don't understand what's going on? Do you think that those victims whom you try to entrap, 
Don't talk. And yes, I know what you tell them. This is from back when I was in Vancouver. Oh, but don't tell anybody. You would meet people for coffee. If you're serious, meet us in your office. And we don't trust you, so we need lawyers with us. And you should be paying for them. Because you put us in this position to begin with. So law enforcement, RCMP, I do not trust you. And the Muslim community should not trust them. Because if you are trusting them to look after us, it's like asking a wolf to look over your sheep. You're not intelligent if you, if you trust them. You have to open your eyes and see the realities. Once again, I'm not talking about the guy who stops you for speeding and running a red light and the traffic. I'm not talking about transit police and so on. No. I'm talking about a, a larger agenda. You know, I, I think I used this example before. And, and now, oh, we, do you need our help? Do, we're here to protect you. Come on, give me a break. You are the reason this happened. It's like a person who comes and punches you in the face so hard and then comes with a pack of, of ice, you know, an ice pack. Says, would you like an ice pack? I'm here for you. <laughs> Seriously? You bomb the you-know-what out of Muslim countries and then you send them, you know, airplane loads of, of aid. Well, they, didn't, they wouldn't have needed it if you didn't bomb them to kingdom come to begin with. Let's be intelligent. Let's open our minds and see things as they are. And you know what? We live in a free country. We can say these things. We can say these things because I have a right to do so. When you speak against Islam and you falsely accuse Islam and Muslims, we respond, but we respond in a decent manner. But we don't do any nonsense. Some people might, but you know what? You can't pin that on all, all of the Muslim community. In any event, I'm telling you that these are the major problems. And so this is why I will come in just a little while and talk about certain proposals or, or, or certain solutions that I see. All right. Um, and, and just to, to let everybody know, we also need to realize that part of the problem is us. Part of the problem is internal. One, there are way too many within the Muslim community who have an inferiority complex. We believe that we are second-class citizens. We believe because we're people of color. We believe because our first language, some of us, our first language may not be English. We believe because perhaps our parents or grandparents immigrated to this country. We believe that we're not as Canadian as the guy next door. Guess what? I'm as Canadian as the next guy. You're living in this country legally. You have citizenship. You are a legal resident. You're as Canadian as the next guy. You're allowed to say what everybody else says. You're allowed to do as everybody else does. You are not inferior. Don't even get me started. Where you might have some of the ignorant, some of the ignorant, who think that in order to be Canadian, you have to be white-skinned. Don't even get me started. Let's go to the reserves and start talking about it there and see what they have to say about that. Let's see if they think that, yeah, the white man is a real Canadian or not. So don't even, don't even go there with us. You're in, just because you're white, it doesn't mean you're not an immigrant. You're an immigrant. My parents were immigrants. Yes, yeah, so what? We're Canadians though now. I have, so the Muslim community, I'm begging you, get rid of that immigrant mentality. Well, I, you, you know how bad it gets? I still remember, you know, uh, there are Muslims that used to come to me with certain things. Things that they saw were wrong. They found something. And so this needed to be reported to the police. But they asked if I could do it on their behalf. And I said, why? 
<laughs> Why can't you go? Oh, no, no, it's the police. So what if it's the police? What are they going to do to you? They'll thank you for reporting a crime. They'll thank you for returning stolen property or lost property. What's the big deal? Oh, really? That's how it is here? Because back home, I mean, all I know is Canada. I mean, I came here when I was just a kid. But that mentality, I, I was blown away by it. Or when speaking, some of them would say, shh, why? He says, you know, the walls have ears. It's like you know what I'm talking about. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Oh, you never know, you know. They can't even trust their own family members. Maybe his wife is going to go report him. I mean, that paranoid or, or vice versa. That, that's how paranoid some immigrant mentality. Get rid of it. You live in Canada. You have rights. Exercise those rights. One of our biggest problems is that we cower. We think, oh, we, we, we feel that we are not the same as all other Canadians. No, if you're a Canadian citizen, you've been living here all your life, whatever, for how many ever years, you have the same rights. Do not think that you have to be fearful of the authorities. Don't trust them because of the reasons I've mentioned. But don't be fearful of them. Do not be fearful. We have nothing to fear. We've done nothing wrong. So I'm begging the Muslim community, get that out of your minds. And I'll tell you, as a result of that, what happens? I've been in meetings. As a result of that, you find that Muslims, even in the media now, even after what happened, instead of Muslims being open and speaking as I'm speaking now, what are you going to find them doing? They want to say what they believe people want to hear instead of saying what needs to be said. Do we get it? So you know, uh, we're loving people. Yes, all of that we know. And guess what? Your neighbors know it too. It's redundant. You want to keep repeating it? We're, we're, you know, we're peaceful people. Everybody knows. As a matter of fact, they know. But it's the media and the government that's making them think otherwise. Tackle the real problem. Tell it to them as it is. The media, they try to contact us. Why should I give them the time of day? They don't deserve it. They're looking for ways to put words in our mouth or to misquote us. So I don't need to give them the time of day. One of the other problems with us because of that immigrant mentality and whatever, and, and by the way, that immigrant mentality Again, I told this directly to those RCMP agents. I said, listen, and my kids happened to be there, they're too young to remember. I said to the guy, listen, okay, I'm not a person that just walked off the boat. I know that you use intimidation tactics on others. What are you going to do to me? Send me back to Chilliwack? No, I'm sorry. It ain't going to happen. No, we got to pound your chest. My dad, Allah yarhamu, used to tell me, if you're in the right, pound your chest and say it at the top of your lungs. Don't be afraid. Rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi. So no, don't have that. Don't go out and tell people what you think they want to hear. Tell them what they need to hear. Tell them what is in your heart. Tell them what you see and what you observe. Then we can dialogue. Then we can really get somewhere. Okay, so again, what happened saddens us, we feel anger, we're shocked, whatever, but our response has to be measured. And we also have to, in, where do we go from here? How do we solve things? Well, I've mentioned a little bit, a little bit of, of that already. Okay, so I'm just going to go back because I've way gone off what I was going to say. Um, I think that what we need to do is, we need to change the narrative. The meetings that we have with law enforcement, the meetings that we have with politicians, tell them that they are not photo ops. Tell them that these meetings are not to be turned into media circuses. Every time I say something, I think of something else. Going back, rewinding. 
almost 15 years ago, 14 years ago, I was misquoted and the media, the media tried to make a big deal of something that was not a big deal. No, 14 years ago, buddy, that was not what it was. Anyway, they tried to make a big deal of things and tried to make me look like this huge criminal and so on and so forth. He made me lose my, my train of thought. Anyways, after that, a Jewish group contacted me and they wanted to meet. Somebody was coming from Toronto. And then, I don't, I don't think the kids even know about it, but there was something called a fax machine. <laughs> we didn't have, you know, we were not using internet quite as much. But anyway, a lot of these official things used to happen by, by fax. So I received a fax, and I responded, and I agreed to the meeting, because I had put out a statement where I said that if uh, people from different religious groups, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, whatever, if you want to have meaningful dialogue, then I'm willing to sit and talk to you. And so, this meeting was set up. I was more than happy to sit with them. And then it crossed my mind. Hmm. Is this a serious call for a meeting? Or is it one of those things that they want to turn into a media circus? So I responded back to them, or I wrote to them again, and I said, yes, I would like to confirm that the meeting will be for such and such a day, at such and such a time, at this location, but no media is invited, no media should be brought into it. Because I don't do things for photo ops. I don't do things, you know, to, to earn a name. We do things sincerely. We want something meaningful. Keep it between us. And perhaps we can build on that. Guess what happened? The meeting was canceled. All of a sudden, plans changed and they were not able to make it and they were gonna get back to me. I'm a patient man, I've been waiting over 14 years. Still waiting for that meeting. As I said, one thing leads to another. The Vancouver Police Department, something similar happened. Some outreach thing. And I went and I spoke. And I saw the pictures in, the, in, in, that, in that meeting room that we were in with the community leaders and so on and so forth. And I made it very clear to them, I'm not one of them. I'm willing to sit with you, but for meaningful dialogue for us to discuss issues and talk about, you know, talk turkey as they say. But not just to make ourselves feel better and uh, a picture in the paper. There was a meeting between this community leader and the Vancouver Police Department. I was also told that they would get back to me. It's been at least 12 years, I would think, by now, if not more. But I'm a patient man. Let's see. They know very well. But they will knock on those doors where they know that people will tell them what they want to hear. Similarly, in 2017, there was a meeting in Vancouver and I attended that meeting and that's where I told, you know, uh, that individual that it's their fault. So they know exactly. But the problem is, because of those others that were in that room with the immigrant mentality, you can be born here and still have that immigrant mentality. There are people who live here for 40 years plus, they still have that immigrant mentality and they, they, they feel like they're second class citizens. One guy called me up from Ottawa, PhD in nuclear, I don't know what, and he wanted to talk to me. If you know, these people gave you a home. Hang on a second. First of all, I'm not from your country. You don't even know where the heck I'm from. So don't give me all that, you know, spiel, that story, that backstory. No, I, I don't need all of that. I am a Canadian citizen. That's what matters. I can say whatever I want. I mean, of course, within reason. There are guidelines. I'm not saying I can say whatever I want and cause havoc. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. 
But that mentality in that meeting as well, guess what? So everybody was, was clapping for them. Oh, mashallah. When, when I said what I had to say, and I was the only one who was telling it like it is, that's what I believe. What did the others do? Oh, but they come and, and share iftar with us. They, they, they eat with us, break fast with us. Well, first of all, they weren't fasting, so I don't know how they broke their fast. But anyways, they came to share food with us. Tayyip, guess what? They probably came in because they want to spy on you. I'm sorry, but that's, this is how the authorities have got me thinking, because that's how they are. Oh, you know, they played, uh, they played basketball with the, with, with the kids. So, that's going to change, the, like, that's going to change things. And again, these are who? Transit police and whatnot. I mean, that's, come on, give it, give it a rest. Grow up. Don't insult my intelligence. These are the types of things that carry on. These are realities and truths that I want to put out there. Because it doesn't seem like anybody else is willing to do that. But these are facts. So I'm saying that we need to have a real dialogue. Okay? Uh, now, our time is, is up, but I want to just go through a few of the things that I'm, I'm proposing. Number one. Uh, although I, I, I may just uh, sort of summarize, realize that we are not second-class citizens. Number two, keep living as we are. We are law-abiding, peaceful citizens. Everybody that I know here is. All the Muslims that I've come into contact with are, for the most part, of course. There's the odd one who's done, I mean, they haven't done you know, the type of thing that we're speaking of, maybe they've stolen and they've, which is not good also, but I mean, you know what I'm talking about. We are good people. You have to believe that. And you know what? Most of your neighbors do. But sometimes it's we who don't believe that we're good people. We're, we've, been, we've been brainwashed into thinking that we're bad. No, keep living as you are. You have the same concerns as everybody else. Muslim organizations need to get their act together. I said that many of our problems are internal. The vast majority, if not all of these organizations, are run by people who have that immigrant mentality and who have that inferiority complex. And they are intimidated. And I have seen and heard, seen with my own eyes, heard with my own ears in those meetings, whether it be after the Toronto 17 incident, whether it be, uh, you know, uh, uh, two years ago, I have seen that they are not open-minded. Yutabbilun. And they, you know, like to they, they pat each other on the back, say all these warm and fuzzy things, instead of saying what needs to be said. Another thing, Law enforcement, if you are serious, which up to now you've proven that you are not, if law enforcement is serious, then they will really talk to us. They will really hear us out, really understand what our issues are, and they will call their dogs off of us. Those spies that you keep sending, the ones that you keep trying to recruit, stop it. You are pathetic. You're making us targets. And we've done absolutely nothing wrong. And we're willing to tell you that right to your face. And the same applies to politicians. I'm sorry to say, but... You know, politics has, has gone to hell in a handbasket. Politicians with a few, few, few exceptions, they'll sell their mothers for votes. Seriously. No, no sense of, of morality, nothing whatsoever. They'll tow, you know, the, uh, the, the party lines. And it's all about photo ops. There's no, n nothing serious that we've heard from them. They need to start doing exactly what I said that the, uh, the law enforcement has to do. I want to repeat, we have absolutely, we, Muslims at large, we as a community, we have absolutely nothing to apologize for. We've done nothing wrong. We have not incited hatred. The media says we have. We have not. 
You and I know how we live. When have we threatened anybody? When have we done anything wrong to anyone? We have not. But they repeat it so often that they make some of us think, hey, we're bad. Yeah, yeah, we, we should be nicer. To we're already nice. We've done nothing wrong. Stop apologizing. We've done absolutely nothing wrong. We are peaceful citizens. We have been for ages and we continue to be. Another very important thing, we do not respond in like. Meaning what? Meaning that because somebody went and shot up a bunch of Muslims in a mosque in New Zealand or two mosques in New Zealand and in Quebec City and in uh, the United States or wherever it may be, we don't do the same thing. Because it is wrong. Because Islam teaches us we're not allowed to do it. That Islam that you're accusing of being bloodthirsty, that Islam taught me, and I spoke a bit about it yesterday, that Islam taught me that lives matter. That there is value to human life, whether that human life is that of a Muslim or a non-Muslim. You and I don't have a right to take a life just like that. And even in times of war, places of worship are protected. Women and children are, who are non-combatant, of course, women, they are not to be touched. Crops. I mean, unbelievable what Islam teaches us. So we do not respond in like. We don't carry out terrorist attacks because somebody did that. Somebody did that to us. And they blame all of us. They blame Islam and the Muslims. But we will not blame the white people. We will not blame Christianity. We will not blame Buddhism. We will not blame religions. And we will not blame nations as a whole. They do that to us, but we don't respond. We don't respond in like. It is as simple as that. Islam teaches us to be fair and just. All right? So, I, as I said, there were th some things that I needed to get off my chest, and I, I felt I needed to share these with everybody. There's lots more, um, but I think I'll, I'll have to stop because our time for Isha is coming up. But I implore everyone, let's work on real change. Okay? And I don't mean to offend anyone. Nobody should take offense. We appreciate when sincere people come and say to us that they are sorry for what happened. I say to them, it's not your fault. And subhanAllah, you know, once again, besides what we see, I mean, you, you know, even after the Quebec City incident, and I think even after this one, in, in, I think it happened in Ottawa, a, a lot of non-Muslims, when Muslims were going to the mosque to pray, they made a human wall. I mean, it was just a sign to show that, you know what, we're here for you. So we understand that. I think, I don't know if it was my daughter or somebody was with me. You know, after 9-11, it, it just happened on that day. And it was Ramadan. If I'm not mistaken, it was Ramadan. And I was at Save On Foods. I don't work for them, I'm not advertising for them, it just so happens I was there. <laughs> I was at Save On Foods, walking down an aisle, and I'm pretty sure it was my daughter that was with me, and all of a sudden, I feel somebody grab my hand. I'm walking, and somebody from behind me came and grabbed my hand. I turned around, it was a lady, and she says to me, it's okay, we know you didn't do anything. Right? I mean, people can t interpret it in, in, in different ways, but that was something meaningful. It showed me that, no, there are decent people out there. And then I was driving home and I saw these two SUVs behind me that are never down my street, which was just a side street in, 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 uh, in Richmond. I wonder who was in those SUVs <laughs> with the, you know, the lights outside. Anyways, um, yeah. And then I was being followed by law enforcement. Like, what? What on earth? Understand? Anyhow, um, as I said, Although there is much more to be said, I think I will suffice with that. And I would like to, to tell everyone, listen, by all means, let's talk about things, let's discuss things, we take measures, but there's no need for us to, to be in a frenzy and to think that, you know, it's going to happen to us next. It could, yes. I mean, let's, 
But let's not, um, let, let's not blow things out of proportion. Let us remember where we are, do as we are doing, and inshaAllah ta'ala, Allah will, will protect us. Hadha wallahu a'lam, wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Very quickly, loss of bladder control. If a person suffers from constant and frequent bladder control and their prayer is cut multiple times, how many wudus do they have to make and how many times do they have to redo their wudu? What is the Islamic ruling on this? So this is referring to um, urinary incontinence, huh? what we call salas al bawl So if it's a condition, and it could happen with wind, it could happen with, uh, with urine, it can happen with, you know, um, uh, defecation, it can happen in, in, in those ways. In any case, so urinary incontinence. If it's a condition where really there's no time when you can say, you know what, I'll be okay for five minutes or seven minutes or ten minutes and I'll be able to pray a prayer without any issue. And some, it's that serious. A slight movement will cause urinary incontinence. In this case, they don't have to worry, meaning that when the time of salah enters and they want to offer that salah, they take their wudu, they take their wudu, and they place something in their uh, underwear to absorb any urine that may leak, okay? And they pray, and even if urine comes out, they don't have to worry. Their salah is valid. They don't even have to go and repeat once. They pray as they are. وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجٍ Allah Jalla didn't place any hardships on us. So if it's that serious, you don't have to worry. Okay? But if there are times when you know from this time to that time, I'm usually okay, then you pray during that time, you do your wudu, and alhamdulillah, you don't have, you don't have an issue. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. If this person leading prayer... Uh, it's better for that person, it's better for that person not to lead others in prayer if they have that condition. But if they happen to be the ones who are in charge, for example, or they are the ones who are leading because they're... Uh, whatever the circumstances, inshaAllah ta'ala, la ishka. It's okay because they have that ruhr, they have that um, valid and legitimate excuse. You want that Imam Malik can be an Imam Malik? Yes. Imam Malik can usiba be the Sulli. No. So, as we said, there's no issue. The person, the person may pray, as we have mentioned. It's become widely spread in the Muslim regions to terminate pregnancies before the 40 days for no medical, uh, medically viable reason. Um, because some people told, someone told them that, you know what, as long as the ruh, the, the soul has not been breathed into the, uh, into the fetus, then it's just a bunch of cells, so it's permitted to terminate. Uh, there's a verse that states, no, actually we're talking about a hadith, and it's not 40 days, it's 120 days. Um, طيب. So basically, basically, just to summarize, because it, it, it's quite um, it, it's quite long, طيب. And then they say uh, the re some of the reasons given. I don't think uh, oh, I'm too tired. Um, I don't have any more patience to handle kids. Uh, we're too poor to provide for them. Um, طيب. So basically, people aborting their fetuses because they feel like it. They don't feel like they want to have a child. And these are some of the excuses given. Number one, number one, the number one reason that I'll address is, I can't afford it. 100%, without any difference of opinion among the ulama, among the scholars, performing an abortion, even alone performing an abortion, even using birth control with that excuse that I can't afford it, it's haram. It's impermissible. If the excuse is, I can't afford it. Wa 
وَإِيَّاكُمْ So Allah Jalla wa'ala says that no, you may not do so out of fear of poverty. Who is the provider? It is Allah. He provides for you and them. And another verse, them and you. Allah is the ultimate provider. When we have children, Allah Jalla wa'ala may open up doors that you never imagined. Anyways, that's a topic on its own. So if that's the reason that people want to practice birth control, or worse, abortion, they want to do an abortion because they think they're too poor, لا. for sure it's not allowed. Absolutely it's not allowed. بنص القرآن Allah Jalla wa'ala has mentioned it to us. طيب. Other reasons, I think I'm too tired, I'm not sure that I can handle another child. All of these are nonsense reasons. Not legitimate reasons. If you want to practice birth control, I'm not saying that it's recommended, I'm not saying that you should do it, but if somebody wants to use a form of birth control, in other words, preventing pregnancy, for those reasons, other than poverty, I don't think I can handle it yet, and I have too many kids, and I've had them all one after the other. If you use birth control for those reasons, it's not haram. It's not impermissible. It's not a sin. That is being proactive. I mean, you don't want a child. We're not saying to you it's a good thing, but okay. This is your choice for whatever reason. You want to delay having children, etc., etc. Khairan, inshallah. We hope, inshallah, there's no sin in that. But, when a woman falls pregnant, Allah Jalla wa'ala has decreed for this child to be born. And you want to interfere with that? Just go in and have an abortion because you feel like it? This is now trying to tamper with what Allah Jalla wa'ala wants. Allah wants wanted you to get pregnant. He wants you to, 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 to go full term and to, to, to have that child. And now, just for the sake of it? No. There may be some um, medical reasons valid. Not all reasons are valid also. Doctors aren't always right. I mean, I know of one family, just one family who came to me on two separate occasions. Both of their children, they were told by doctors that they should terminate. Terminate the pregnancy because they did some tests and these child and you know the quality of life blah 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 I mean very often they may be they may be accurate, but not it's not a hundred percent But these are people who have deen who Who have faith and so I was able to speak to them at that level and I said I don't recommend that you do so After hearing everything and you know what the chances are and what they thought I said listen Allah forbid, but let's say that you give birth to a child who may not be perfect physically. They may have some health issues and so on and so forth. Why not we now, why, why not we look at some of the rewards that you will get from Allah Jalla for raising such a child, for looking after such a child. That child could be your ticket to Jannah. Can we not look at things in that way also? That's for people who have a legitimate excuse. So there are some legitimate reasons. I mean, sometimes the woman may become pregnant, but it's a very complicated pregnancy, and it could lead to her death. It could mean, you know, life or death for her. In this case, it is understood. That is an exception to the rule. But just because, this is, you know, this is playing with uh, potential lives here. Okay? This is not... Where is the, the, the hurma? Where is the sanctity? I mean, you're saying that it's because it doesn't have a soul, it doesn't detect a heartbeat, and that's all there is to it for you? Just a bunch of cells? Well, those cells grow into something. So why do you want to abort? Just because of, if you really don't want to have kids, then use birth control. Don't wait and then say, oops, you know what? I don't think I want this child. And just abort. I believe from the bottom of my heart that people who do this, they will have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. With what face are you going to meet Allah? Ask yourself that question. 
Allahu a'lam. Khabasatun kita. Ya, jazakallah khair.